Hello everyone, welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more. So today we have a new topic that is fluorides. So fluorides will be covered under different sessions. So today's sessions will be covering about history of fluorides. So what is uh, so much special about fluorides in dentistry? Because uh, nowadays we see uh, fluorides in almost all the dental products like uh, toothpaste or um, our mouthwashes, our gels, everything has fluoride because it has proven that fluoride can prevent dental caries to an extent and fluoride is the most significant element which prevents dental caries. So how uh, we know that the fluoride can prevent dental caries, it is like almost a centurion effort by the scientist and epidemiologist which has ultimately reached a conclusion that fluoride can prevent dental caries. So we have to uh, study the history of fluoride, how the element was uh, invented, how it was found out um, that fluoride causes fluorosis, then it was used to prevent dental caries. And all this will be covered in this chapter. And today's section will be covering about the history of fluorides the scientists and their inventions, their contribution and uh, the significant contribution by few scientists ultimately that contribution leads to the conclusion that fluoride prevent dental caries. So let's see the some basic things about fluorine. It has atomic weight 19, atomic number 9 and it is derived from a latin word fluoro that means to flow <laughs> and it is very electronegative element so it cannot exist as a element and it always stays like with the compound it combines with some other element and like calcium fluoride fluorospar sodium fluoride so it always <laughs> sorry so always it exists as compounds so let's see the historical evolution of fluorides so we have to start with a famous dentist named frederick mckay so in 1901 he finished his dental graduation from pennsylvania dental school and started practicing in a city known as colorado springs in usa so there he found out in many patients some peculiar enamel markings and uh, he could not find any scientific literature to substantiate this peculiar enamel uh, markings and the discoloration or hypomineralization or the brown discoloration on the teeth and he uh, called this enamel as mottled enamel so it looked like white flecks yellow or brown spots which are scattered irregularly and streaked over the surface of the tooth. So Dr. Frederick Mackay was the first name you should remember. He was the pioneer in the fluorosis or the fluorine uh, identification or fluoride and dental caries or fluorine and fluorosis identification. So Dr. Frederick Mackay in 1901. So he identified the Colorado stains or Colorado mottled enamel. Then came Dr. G. V. Black. So he approached a, another doctor or a dentist named G. V. Black. He was that time dean of Northwestern University Dental School. So he did not actually believe it, the theory of or the findings of Dr. Frederick McKay. But what he did was he collected some mottled enamel samples and agreed to attend the Colorado State Dental Association. 1901, 1909, and spent some time in Colorado. So he agreed to uh, visit uh, Colorado uh, Springs uh, for further investigation. But meanwhile, what our Frederick Mackey did was he did a study with the help of Isaac Burton, a Fleming. He did examination uh, among almost 3,000 children in public schools of Colorado Springs and found out that almost 88% of children were with mottled enamel. And he published the same findings uh, along with G.V. Black 
as an endemic imperfection of enamel of teeth heretofore unknown in literature of dentistry this was the first published uh, a finding of uh, dental fluorosis or mortal enamel but still they were not able to find out what was the cause so in 1916 McKay and G.V. Black conducted studies on individuals that is from 26 different communities in USA and concluded that a particular factor in the water causing this mottling of the enamel and that was affecting during the tooth calcification. So similar mottlings were seen in the city of Britain. So it was sitting in the USA not in the uh, United Kingdom. So Britain where the water supply, people's drinking water supply was changed from shallow to deep wells in 1898. So it was found that people were born before 1898 were having normal teeth and people who born after 1898 were in another, another word we can say that people who started drinking the deep well water are started showing enamel mottling. So it made them uh, made them believe that it was due to the particular factor in the water which causing enamel mottling. The same thing was also happened in bauxite because in 1909 this water uh, changed from shallow to deep water. Then came another scientist H. V. Churchill. He was a chief chemist in Alcoa company in Pennsylvania. So that time in USA people were using aluminium uh, aluminium for aluminium ware for cooking but uh, they mentioned that aluminium util utensils cause poisoning because most of the aluminium uh, product that alcohol company taking from bauxite area was the aluminium which is taken from bauxite and in bauxite there were a lot of dental enamel mottling so they thought this problem with aluminium because in bauxite region there are people with mottling of enamel so it could affect uh, us also because of this particular uh, aluminium product so Alcoa company had to answer for this poisoning theory by the people of USA because of the bauxite region people showing enamel mottling and they thought that it was due to the aluminium and Churchill uh, took sample from bauxite and did uh, analysis and found out that 13.7 parts per million of fluoride was present in bauxite water so Churchill was the first person who found out the presence of fluorine in water and later he started um, collecting samples from various regions like uh, Colorado Spring had 2 ppm and the bauxite as I mentioned 13.7 well near Kidder 12 ppm then 11 ppm and 6 ppm so various uh, regions where this modeling were recorded are having high amount of fluorine in the drinking water setup but still there was no precise correlation between fluoride content and this mortal enamel they, they could not establish a proper causal link between this fluoride and modeling of the enamel thereby uh, this company proved that it was not due to the alumina or aluminum is not a poison it was due to the amount of fluorine in the water which is causing fluorosis or the mottling of the enamel at bauxite region so it was uh, to protect their company but uh, accidentally they found out the element fluorine so next came the famous epidemiologist or public health scientist dr h t dean or h friendly dean he conducted some landmark survey in the history of evolution of fluorides that is the shoe leather survey it is commonly asked question and it is very interesting the name is very interesting shoe leather survey so he was appointed um, by united states public health to continue the work of mckay so they wanted to uh, continue the work of dr mckay uh, what was the reason for this uh, modeling of the enamel and what is the connection between 
fluoride and this modeling of the enamel because by the time fluoride was already uh, into uh, picture and they wanted to show the, or prove that this could be a reason for the fluoride could be the reason for fluorosis or modeling of the enamel so surely the survey was done by trendly hd so his first task was to continue Mackey's work to find the extent and geographic distribution of mortal enamel. So he wanted to see how far it is distributed, how much area it was affected. So what he did was he started posting lectures to local and state dental society in country, local physicians asking if mortal enamel existed in their area. So almost 1200 letters he sent and 632 replies were received. Then he started his famous shoe leather survey. Dean and his colleagues started shoe leather survey among the 22 cities in 10 states of USA and collected a 5,824 children and gave a report. And why it was known as shoe leather survey? Because it was a door to door survey because he started walking uh, to each place or his friends started walking and asking questions so it was involving a lot of walking hence it was called as shoe leather survey because of this door-to-door -door survey and a lot of walking and what they found out was a striking feature <coughs> Sorry, you can see that this uh, blank one is normal enamel and this black one is mortal enamel so you can see as the ppm of fluoride is increasing the mottling also started increasing so you can see 0.6 ppm there is no mottling 0.9 there is very little or very mild mottling 1.7 2.5 2.9 3.9 and 4.6 the high mottling is seen so they could found out that the presence of fluorine is directly proportional to the mottling of the enamel that was the biggest uh, conclusion of this shoe leather survey directly proportional fluorine and mottling then this uh, gave the report like a high concentration of fluorine water is directly related to the mottling enamel mottling was widespread in areas with water content more than 3 ppm with a discrete pitting if it is more than 4 ppm whereas mottling was less where it is 2.5 or 3 and no mottling was present where it is around 1 ppm so these were the conclusions of Schuller the survey so mortal enamel gave way to more exact terms so they started calling this mottling of enamel as dental fluorosis because the perfection imperfection was caused by fluorine so they started calling as dental fluorosis and in 1934 dean standardized a classification of fluorosis and it is known as dean's fluorosis index we have already learned it in our practical session and it was modified later in 1942 and in 1942, uh, he found out that drinking 1 ppm of water would, would reduce the caries by 60%. Then he conducted another study, 21 city study. Okay, this is different from Fuller the survey. This was done by Dean Arnold and Elvov in 1942. So what he wanted to prove that there is an inverse relationship between this fluorosis and dental caries. Because what he observed was wherever this fluorosis is present the dental caries was very less so he wanted to prove that the fluorine and caries are inverse relationship sorry not the caries and fluorine fluorosis and dental caries so what he did was caries experience was investigated among 7257 children that is between 12 to 14 years from the 21 cities of four states Okay, this Shula the survey was different. It was done among the 22 cities of 10 states, whereas 21 city studies were done in four states. Okay, so it was done in four states, but 21 cities. It was to prove the relationship of dental fluorosis and dental caries, but Shula the survey was done to prove that enamel, mottling, and the amount of fluorine in water. There is no caries in Shula the survey. 
So in 21 cities concluded that there is an association between the increasing fluoride concentration in the drinking water and decreasing caries experience. So that was the landmark uh, conclusion which uh, created history in public health. Because they found out that maximal reduction in caries experience occurred with a concentration of 1 ppm of fluoride drinking water. And this became the foundation of fluoridation of water, fluoridation of toothpaste, fluoridation of all the other products to get a net effect of 1 ppm. So 1 ppm was approved by the World Health Organization in later times. Uh, so as to provide uh, fluorides to people with uh, less uh, or more caries area and less fluoride in drinking water, WHO only recommended to start water fluoridation to get the benefit of fluorine to prevent dental caries. So it is like double edged sword. If it goes very higher, it creates problem like fluorosis. If it is very less, it has no benefit and there will be caries. So it has to be at an optimal level that is 1 ppm. So this was the graph where they found out after the 21 city studies. So we can see that the ppm is on the x-axis and the uh, caries experience on the y-axis. Okay. So you can see there is an inverse relationship as the fluoride content is going high there is a significant reduction in the caries you can see this curve is going downward as the fluoride is going on the x-axis so there is an inverse relationship between caries experience and fluoride so that's all about uh, history of fluorides so in next session we'll be seeing about systemic fluoride where they started uh, water fluoridation studies after this uh, world health organization or the not World Health Organization, uh, after this US Public Health uh, Service started uh, giving permission to uh, water fluoridations in certain cities and uh, it has all proved that uh, there was a reduction of around 50 to 60 seconds. So that was uh, a different story of the water fluoridation studies and it was uh, among uh, some six, seven cities in Canada and USA. So they all proved that water fluoridation was effective in preventing dental caries. So that's all about history of uh, dental fluorosis and uh, its effect with the dental caries. And uh, just for your information, fluorides are present all over the lithosphere, biosphere and atmosphere. So it is an inorganic fluoride compound and it is uh, this lake you have to remember highest natural fluoride concentration it is nakuru lake in kenya almost 2800 ppm so we were talking about three four five ppm and this is 2800 ppm that is lake nakuru in kenya and the 15 states in india are affected with fluorosis some states almost 50 to 100 states these all are coming in uh, fluoride toxicity so I just want to show that some natural products which is having high amount of fluorine that is tea leaves having high amount of fluorine that is 3.2 to 400 ppm and the uh, fish products like salmon, sardines have fluoride content, cereals, bananas. So that's all about history of fluorides. It started from Dr. Frederick McKay, then G.V. Black, then Churchill. Uh, then came our famous Trentley SD. He conducted 21 city studies and shoe leather survey. Finally found out that giving 1 ppm fluoride in drinking water would prevent dental caries. So US Public Health adopted this uh, concept and started giving permission for water fluoridations. So after that, in 1945, the first artificial fluoridation uh, started in uh, USA. So in next video, I'll be explaining more about this water fluoridation uh, studies uh, under systemic water fluoridation. So this video mainly includes the history of fluorides.
uh, and various scientists, various uh, surveys and uh, landmark achievements by the scientists. So uh, the next uh, sessions will be having systemic topical fluoride toxicity and defluoridation techniques. But in India, there is no scope for water fluoridation because as I told you, 15 out of 30 states, including the Union territories are affected with endemic fluorosis. So we are into the action of defluoridation, but this community water fluoridation, is a great movement and a great invention in the public health sector and it was started in USA and uh, they continued this water fluoridation for at least 30 to 40 years and in around 1970 since this toothpaste star into the market which provide equal effect of uh, caries protection it slowly started disappearing all most of the plants were closed uh, around 1970s because the same uh, benefit could be obtained by the toothpaste so why to waste so much money the installation charges for water fluoridation but this was the this was how fluoride came into our dentistry and how it protected dental caries this was one of the landmark invention or achievement by the public health okay so i'll come up with a, a system of fluoridation in my next video okay. so today's topic is systemic fluoride so systemic fluoride is about how fluoride is used by a person uh, we can use it by two methods one is systemic route and the another one is topical routes so today's video will cover the systemic fluorides and its methods its uh, advantages the mechanism uh, the next video i'll be covering about the topical fluorides so in systemic fluorides as the name suggests it's a route of administration is systemic uh, and it's uh, effect on the teeth is different uh, compared to the topical one so let's move on to the topic so let's see what are the contents uh, how it is working uh, types and water fluidation studies uh, school and salt milk fluidation and uh, other supplements which includes tablets lozenges and other things so systemic fluorides it provides a very low concentration of fluoride to the teeth for a longer period of time. Mostly, the systemic fluoride works till six or seven years. Why? Because it uh, affects the mineralization stages of teeth. So, mineralization stages completes by seven years. That is the second molars, the second last tooth of our eruption sequence second last tooth the second molar it gets mineralized by the age of six or seven so the systemic fluoride should use this potential after that there is no point for systemic fluoridation because it goes to our bloodstream it enters to our bloodstream <laughs> sorry then uh, this fluoride enters to the teeth while it's getting mineralized and it gives a firm structure to the firm art structure to the enamel so it becomes resistant to dental caries that is the uh, rational behind this systemic fluoridation so it should be before six to seven years so once the teeth erupts fluoride contacts the teeth through the salivary secretion but that is a topical effect so that is systemic fluorides so i have mentioned you about the uh, its mechanism it goes to the developing stages of teeth until six or seven years and it replaces the hydroxyl ion in the enamel lattice and replaces uh, replaced with the fluoride it makes the enamel lattice more stronger so that is the mechanism so we have various types of systemic fluorides common one is water fluoridation then salt milk and fluoride tablets in water fluoridation we have community and school water fluoridation so it's all we are consuming inside it enters the systemic circulation so let's see a brief uh, intro of all these mechanisms water fluoridation 
commonly we use one ppm that is one parts per million in salt or school water fluid it ranges from two to three ppm because uh, the amount of water consumed by the school children will be low and the amount of the days uh, the children's attend will be less compared to uh, community water fluoridation because community water fluorides supplies water to the house so we tend to drink more water from the house than compared to the school so to get a 1 ppm effect we need to have more uh, increase uh, increase the ppm or concentration of fluoride because of the less intake in salt or school water fluoridation milk again it is uh, comparatively very less consumption than the salt or school water so it has to be 5 ppm to get a 1 ppm net effect and we have some other supplements like uh, fluoride tablets uh, apf sodium fluoride and other stuff so by definition it is the upward adjustment of concentration of fluoride so we are increasing the amount of fluoride to get an optimal level so as to give a maximum protection against dental caries so it is upward adjustment of the concentration of fluoride in community water supply to achieve a maximum caries reduction and clinically insignificant level of fluorosis so we are giving an upward adjustment so defluidation we will be learning uh, in the future videos so that will be downward adjustment so water fluidation is always upward adjustment presently the fluoride amount will be very less so we increase the amount of fluoride so water fluidation is one of the common delivery mechanisms because of its low cost and long range the problem is always we need to uh, control the ppm of water and it depends on the regional temperature if it is a hot climate or hot uh, region we have to give less ppm and at on a colder climate we have to increase the ppm so the optimal as i mentioned it should be one ppm or one parts per million it gives a 50 to 70 percentage of reduction from the dental caries so we have seen the history of uh, fluoride how history of fluoride evolved and ultimately reached to the uh, water fluidation so we have some water fluidation studies so it uh, proves that the water fluidation mechanism would definitely reduce the caries by 40 to 60 percentage so the first two water fluidation program was started in united states in 1945 that was grand rapids muskegon study the newburgh kingston evanston oak park Branford sarnia stratford study and teal Bloomberg study so all these studies are very important uh, with respect to the fluoridation, water fluoridation. The first study we need we you not to uh, go very in detail about all these studies. You just need to know what time it started, what was the percentage you know, reduction, and how much duration was it. So it started in 1945 in Grand Rapids. That was the water fluoridation city, and Muskegon was kept as controlled. After six years, the caries reduction was 50 percentage compared to the control city. Okay, so that is the first study, Grand Rapids and Muskegon City, Muskegon study. So always the first city will be the intervention city, and the second name will be the control city. The reduction was 50 percentage, and after six years, started 1945, checked 1951. Okay, so the second study, Newburgh Kingston, Newburgh was the intervention and kingston was the control it started in 1945 after 10 years the reduction was 23.5 to 13.9 percentage so the next study is evanston oak park 1946 the intervention was at evanston and illinois and the nearby community oak park acted as a control town so it was 14 years of fluidation and the reduction was 49 percentage so Evanston was the intervention city of park and 
Illinois. Where the control set is. The Branford Sarnia Bradford study. So Branford was uh, intervention. He was in Canada. So 1945. So Sarnia along with Stratford were kept as a control. So after 17 years of fluoridation, the Branford, Branford and uh, Branford were reported. Branford and this Stratford controls were reported. Uh, 50 percentage of lower than the control. So this was the intervention. This way, these two were the controls. So 55 percentage of reduction of caries was reported at intervention. That is uh, Branford City. Steel Columbus was steel was uh, its study was in 1953. Steel was uh, fluoridated, Columbus was kept as control, and after 13 years, it was 58 percentage reduction in the intervention city that is steel. So, those were the water fluoridation studies. Most of the studies reported around 50 to 60 percentage of reduction of dental caries. So, how the temperature affects uh, this fluoride level that is, uh, we are going to discuss. We have said the optimal level is not exactly one, it ranges from 0.7 to 1.2 because when it is very high temperature or the temperature of this area or the water is more, we have to give very less amount that is 0.7 is fine and the colder side we have to give 1.2 ppm. So it is based on a formula that is Galgan's formula that is 0.34 divided by E. E is minus 0 0.038 plus 0 0.0062x temperature of the area. So we have to multiply into temperature. So E is coming at the denominator. So always temperature is inversely proportional to the amount of flow rate. So what are the pre requirements of high water fluoridation? So there should be some significant amount of caries in community and uh, level of Fluoride concentration should be low. There should be centralized water supply and there should be acceptance from the community and there will be a huge installation and maintenance cost. So this is important because uh, these are the three mechanisms or the equipments used for water fluoridation that is dry feeder, solution feeder and saturation method. In dry feeder, the, amount, the compounds such as ammonium silica fluoride and flow spar sodium silica fluoride is used. Solution feeder is hydrofluorosilicic acid. So three mechanisms. This is a mechanism used for water fluidation or the equipments, fluoride equipments, dry feeder, solution feeder and saturation feeder. How fluoride is mixed to the water, community water. So then the saturation system, the last system, what we are doing is 4% saturated solution of sodium fluoride. It is injected at desired concentration in the water distribution using a pump. So 4% solution of sodium fluoride is injected to the water. In tri feeder, the sodium fluoride or silica fluoride in the form of powder is introduced and dissolved. So here it is a solution, here it is powder. That's why dry feeder. This is saturated system and solution feeder is volumetric pump permitting the addition of a given quantity. So it, we use a pump volumetric pump and put hydrofluorosilicic acid in proportion the water of uh, water what we are going to treat. So this is a volumetric pump mechanism and uh, dry feeder is different where we add powder into this dissolving basin and saturator is solution we inject with a pump. So what are the advantages of water fluidation? Because it can give benefit to a very large number of people because it is mixed in a community water supply. An entire city can be prevented carries by 50%. So it, it not just act systemically, but also it has a topical effect through the release of saliva. So it has definitely a systemic effect. It enters to the blood circulation and it goes to the teeth formation. Similarly, it has a saliva effect. So
so it always keep replenishing the lost minerals or lost fluoride from the tooth so it has a topical and systemic effect so fluoridation of community is the least expensive way to provide fluoride to a large group of people so it is the least because even though it has a very big amount of installation cost considering the large population it serves it becomes the least expensive way but on the other side we have some disadvantages and one is the ethical issue because ultimately once we start a community water supply all the people in that community are bound to drink that water there is no choice of rejection if i don't want to drink that particular water for any reason uh, i'm not uh, i can't do that because the water supply is coming to my uh, house and i am bound to drink that particular water so human uh, rights is violated here the right to reject is violated the ethical issues are there and uh, we have other modes uh, which is not considered here and common source of water supply if it is not there this is not possible it has to be there has to be a central supply of water then only this will be uh, possible so what we have seen is a community water supply that is a community a common centralized water is mixed with fluoride by any of the methods dry feeder solution feeder or the saturator saturator feeder system and all of the community people drinking that water the next is cool water fluoridation now we are mixing the fluoride to the school water tank okay so school water fluoridation in the beginning i told you the amount of ppm will be high because the number of hours a student spends in the school is less and the amount of water he drinks is also less so to get a 1 ppm net effect he has to drink a water with as more ppm or 3 3.5 ppm water if he drinks then only that 1 ppm net effect he would get so usually uh, 3 to 4 4 to 5 ppm so it ranges between 3 4 5 so usually these are the these are the reasons because of the short period of stay at school to compensate for holidays and vacations so it first started in 1954 at st thomas st virgin islands so there it started so it has to be at a higher level of ppm so we can give 4 to 5 ppm to compensate their shorter period and holidays and vacations so usually we give 4 to 5 that's 4.5 times or 4 to 5 ppm normally it is 1 ppm so i have to give 4 or 5 times more so it also gives reduction 22 to 25 to 40 percentage so advantage is good result minimal equipments and not very expensive but the disadvantage is uh, children do not receive the benefit until they go to school because they go to school by the age of 5 by that time most of the teeth are already mineralized so we are not able to use the pre eruptive uh, mineralization cycle that is the ultimate uh, aim of this uh, systemic fluoridation because we have to get uh, fluoride incorporated into the tooth while it gets mineralized so that finishes by 6 years or 7 years so what if if the child goes to school at 5 years so most of the teeth maybe molars and premolars are already mineralized left is a uh, second molars and canines so the major portion of the major parts or the major tooth are already mineralized so that is a one problem and next is not all children go to the school some from the poor countries and towns village they don't go to the school so amount of water drink also can't be regulated some people drink water some people don't drink the students drinking habit is not regularized we are we can't monitor it so some people may get the benefit some people may not so all these problems are there with regard of this uh, school water fluoridation 
So next we have salt fluoridation. Salt fluoridation is started by Westby in Switzerland 1948. So in 1955 onwards they started selling fluoride salt. So usually sodium or potassium fluoride is mixed with salt. So it is like 90 milligram of fluoride per kilogram of salt. Or 250 to 350 milligram per kilogram. So it can be added by two processing known as one is batch processing and the continuous processing. So for the better caries prevention, fluoride must be present in ionic form when salt is dissolved in water. That is sodium chloride. So it should be uh, ionic form. That fluoride has to be at its ionic form. When the sodium chloride is dissolved in water, then only this caries prevention will happen. So we can, uh, there are essentially two different salt production process like batch processing and continuous processing. So one method is fluoride is added to the salt by spraying concentrated solution of sodium fluoride or potassium fluoride. So the solution is directly spread to the salt. Sodium fluoride or potassium fluoride, we spray it on the normal salt or we have granules of sodium fluoride and calcium fluoride so premix granules of sodium fluoride and calcium fluoride with phosphate are added to the common salt either the granules or just spraying so advantages it is safe and it does not require community water supply as in case of uh, water fluoridation we can uh, we, there's no need of uh, any centralized supply uh, and it has no ethical issues if somebody doesn't want it can reject it it's low cost so all these are the advantages and disadvantages uh, the main problem is uh, sodium is always associated with hypertension and, um, and there is international effort to reduce the intake of sodium and there is no precise control how much salt it varies from person to person so we cannot just uh, regulate the amount being consumed the next one is milk fluoridation it started by Ziegler salt was started by Westby this was started by Ziegler and both are in Switzerland okay so this is like uh, mixing uh, fluoride into water so it gives uh, additional benefits because already milk has some benefits it gives calcium and vitamin d for uh, kids along with fluoride also will be added beneficial uh, rational is nothing but the nutritional value and it gives uh, milk products are very good for their teeth and bones so added benefit will be given if it is fluoridated So how we distribute milk, uh, we can uh, distribute uh, through the school system uh, and like school milk program or such programs will be there for kindergarten or nursery schools. So either uh, fluoridated milk can be produced like one liquid pasteurized and sterilized or powder can be mixed into this, uh, this uh, milk. So just like salt. Uh, continuous and batch processing is there milk also you can either use in a form of liquid or powder so all these are the products which can be used calcium fluoride sodium fluoride isodium monofluorophosphate and disodium silicon fluoride so after that we have fluoride supplements like tablets drops uh, lozenges so these are not uh, commonly available over the counter but uh, can be prescribed by a dentist or pediatrician so it has to be uh, these all are supplements most commonly used is sodium fluoride it has to be at a range of 0.25 milligram or 0.5 milligram or 1 milligram and they should be taken on a daily basis so this is a, a chart which we can uh, which can be uh, used to calculate the amount of fluoride 
be given to a particular child so this is the amount of fluoride existing in the fluoride uh, water that is the water which we drink or the child drinks so if the particular um, child drinks water with an amount of less than 0.3 ppm and its age is less than six months we don't need to supplement anything and if the age between six months to three years we can give 0.25 gram additional and up to six years 0.5 gram and six to 16 years one gram we can give additional and if the water supply is less than six ppm and greater than 0.3 ppm we don't need to supplement uh, up to three years three to six years we can give 0.25 and 6 to 16 years we can give 0.5 gram supplement additionally if the water um, drinking water has more than 6 ppm we don't need to supplement uh, fluoride for that particular child so there are so much benefits for uh, these uh, tablets uh, lozenges and drops which gives a reduction 16 to 65 percentage because it has both systemic and topical effects uh, we should always take precautions uh, because of the toxicity because toxicity will be covered in detail on the next video so that's all about uh, fluorides that is systemic fluorides i was uh, explaining about the various fluoridation studies and various mechanisms studies were important and why and how this is uh, getting uh getting into this uh, tooth lattice at what age it uh, gives the protection up to six years why systemic fluoride works beyond that it won't have any much effect because teeth mineralization of tooth will be completed almost up to second molar completed by six to seven years so why this uh, fluoride ppm is different for water fluoridation and salt or milk fluoridation this is community water fluoridation has one ppm but school this salt milk has four to five ppm because the amount and uh, duration of uh, consumption is very different com compared to community because community we will be drinking 24 by 7 unlike school salt or milk fluoridation and uh, various studies we have many studies uh, all we need to remember the intervention city control city the year the duration and the percentage of protection then the fluoride equipments how we add fluoride into community water supply that is dry feeder solution feeder and saturated methods and various advantages and the disadvantages school water fluoridation it will be 4 to 5 ppm that is 4 or 5 times greater and why the reason it was started in 1954 next is salt fluoridation and batch process and continuous process its advantages and disadvantages milk fluoridation its advantages and uh, liquid and powder application and various methods droplets uh, lozenges and tablets it should be daily taken and this table given by american dental association if drinking water has this much ppm we should supplement this amount of ppm to get maximum protection against dental caries okay so that's all about uh, systemic fluoridation and systemic fluoridation uh, the unfortunate part is nowadays uh, very few countries are following system of fluoridation because researchers uh, has confirmed that the net effect of water fluoridation and topical fluoridation is almost same the caries reduction is almost same for water fluoridation and uh, that is system fluoridation and topical fluoridation system fluoridation requires a lot of installation charges where topical fluoridation can be achieved by a single toothpaste so why to waste so much uh, investment time and manpower for community water fluoridation and it violates uh, human rights so from 1970 onwards uh, most of the systemic fluoridation that is community water fluoride 
plants were closed because of the ethical issues and uh, installation and maintenance charge and nowadays uh, the topical effect is more concentrated than the systemic effect because uh, most of the time uh, we think about systemic effect but nowadays the researchers are stressing on the topical effect because to always keep an amount of fluoride in the saliva and GCF that gives a continuous a protective effect against caries uh, than the systemic effect but then that was the very recent uh, invention but uh, still 1970 it was believed that the water fluoridation was the best method and um, that's all about uh, systemic fluoride today we have a new topic in fluorides so that is topical fluoride methods so basically there are two methods to apply fluorides one we have covered already that is uh, systemic methods so that is like we consume fluorides by any uh, as any compound or through uh, water fluoridation or through salt or uh, milk so it enters our blood circulation and get the benefit so it goes to the teeth and uh, bones and it replaces the ions uh, in tooth it replaces hydroxyl ions and makes the enamel lattice very stronger so by it creates a uh, caries protective enamel uh, that is the mechanism of uh, systemic uh, fluoridation or how the fluoride uh, helps to, to prevent dental caries or a better tooth compared to the uh, non-fluoride uh, that tooth without any fluorides. So whereas in topical methods it is entirely different because teeth has completely mineralized so we are applying the topic uh, applying the fluorides on the surface so this can be applied uh, after the eruption of teeth but uh, the systemic uh, fluoridation methods can be uh, done or can be uh, performed even before the eruption of teeth so it goes to the teeth structure while it getting formed so teeth eruption happens uh, very late because most of the teeth that is up to second molar get mineralized by the age of six or seven but the second molar erupts at 13 or 14 age so systemic fluoridation should be done before six to seven years and uh, topical we can do at any time mostly we do on the recently erupted teeth okay so by definition topical fluorides uh, are the delivery systems which provide fluoride for a local chemical reaction to the exposed surfaces of erupted tissue so the indications are caries active individuals uh, recently erupted tooth and people taking radiation therapy that can affect their salivary flow and uh, periodontal surgery where the roots are exposed so how can this topical fluorides uh, be applied so basically it can apply it via a profession like a professional can do it uh, if we go to a dentist and we can uh, do from our home itself so topical fluorides professional application was introduced by bb in 1942 so we know in systemic fluorides we give just 1 ppm or 4 or 5 ppm not more than that but here we are giving 5000 to 19000 ppm which is uh, equivalent to 5 to 15 milligram fluoride why is that difference because in systemic is giving at very low concentration as it is entering into our bloodstream and it is affecting the 
mineralization stage of tooth by topical we are giving on the top or the on the surface of the teeth where we are using the post mineralization phase you basically a tooth has pre eruptive mineralization and post eruptive mineralization so 90% of the total mineralization belongs to pre eruptive so we are utilizing systemic fluorides by this pre eruptive mineralization and just 10% post eruptive mineralization is the topical fluorides target so we need to increase the ppm to very high <coughs> then only we get a net effect of 1 ppm because 1 ppm is optimal effect to prevent dental caries so if topical fluorides needs to be at a net effect of 1 ppm it should be given at very high range because we are giving at a topical side and more than that just 10 percentage utilization of the post eruptive mineralization okay so that is professional application self-application we commonly use uh, dentifices most of the dentifices as uh, fluoride and we can use mouth rinses gels so it has uh, basically less fluorides compared to the professional that is 200 to 1000 ppm but still it is very high compared to the systemic circulation so the reason i already explained to you it was invented by bb in 1942 so what are the basic sources of topical fluorides the first one is toothpaste mouth rinses professional applied gels forms rinses and even our saliva as fluorides so toothpaste we can uh, apply it while uh, brushing mouth rinses like gargling we can do gargling foams uh, can be applied by professional uh, gels can be painted or using a mouth cut so fluoride vehicles how professional application of fluoride done is using a fluoride vehicle that is aqua solution and gel so the property of gel is which adheres to the teeth and eliminates the continuous wetting if it is a solution we need to continuously wet the tooth but if it is a gel it adheres to the tooth and a continuous wetting is not required and thixotrophic solutions which are special type of gels it's not a normal gel but a special type of gels so what is that speciality is it has high viscosity under storage conditions and it becomes fluid under condition of stress so when we apply it to the tooth we apply some pressure it becomes fluid and it enters to the interdental spaces so that is thixotrophic solution this is a fluoride vehicles commonly used in professional methods and who oh, we have seen uh, prophylactic paste so it has uh, fluorides when we do prophylax uh, the tooth might lose its a uh, little bit of fluoride content from the topper layer so it can be replenished if we do a post prophylactic paste application and foam is like uh, it minimizes the risk of fluoride over dosage and maintain the efficacy okay so foam we can apply so it is uh, basically lighter than conventional gel and very uh, little amount is required so it can be easily penetrated into the interproximal area and uh, it doesn't require any suction it is the uh, biggest advantage of foam application next is fluoride varnish and commonly we have two types of varnish the one is durafat and fluor protector so the advantage of varnish is the increasing the time of contact between enamel surface and uh, the fluoride agent because it uh, adheres to the tooth surface uh, for a such a longer period so there is a lot of uh, time for action of this fluoride agents with the enamel surface so durafat is uh, 
product with 22,600 ppm and floor protector is another product which has uh, less ppm that is 7,000 <coughs> sorry and carox is uh, another fluoride concentration which has uh, lesser than uh, durafit uh, but has equal efficacy which is uh, one of the product we used for prevention of uh, dental caries so fluoride application this is a uh, paint on technique this is how we do paint painting so it's just like uh, using a brush we paint the teeth surface so fluoride toothpaste is commonly available uh, toothpaste uh, contains uh, fluoride so fluoride toothpaste are into the market around 50s and 60s so once the fluoride uh, toothpaste are into the market slowly the systemic water fluidation is uh, vanished from the history because uh, most of the plants were closed because the effect of systemic and uh, topical wear in preventing dental caries were almost same so I had to spend a lot of money for installation of a systemic rotation because we have seen already how much cost uh, it requires for a plant setup. So the same effect can be obtained by using a toothpaste. So saliva also has uh, fluorides. So let's see what are the basic three uh, solutions commonly used in uh, topical fluorides that the first one is uh, neutral sodium fluoride acidulated phosphate fluoride or IPF and stannous fluoride okay, it can be applied either by paint on technique so this is a paint on technique we paint on the teeth surface by using a brush or tray technique we apply the material we load the material into tray and apply it okay So aqua solution can be painted and a viscous gel can be used in a tray. So let's see what are the three methods, three compounds. So the first one is uh, neutral sodium fluoride. So for that is 2% uh, of sodium fluoride, which gives a reduction of 30% of dental caries. So it is prepared by dissolving 20 grams of sodium fluoride in 1 liter of distilled water so 20 gram we put in 1 liter we get sodium fluoride so that is known as Knudsen's technique so the basic procedures are we have to clean the teeth and apply it for 3 to 4 minutes we leave it for drying uh, for 3 to 4 minutes so it gets its maximum concentration so beyond four minutes there is no point because the maximum concentration of this fluoride on the two surface be can be obtained within four minutes but the procedure has to be repeated at uh, different intervals that is a second third and fourth application will be there after one week interval so we have to apply uh, at one week interval so there will be four times application of this Knudsen's technique that is 2 percentage sodium fluoride so this four visit procedure is commonly seen in 3 7 11 and 13 years because it coincides with the eruption of different groups of primary and permanent teeth this is very important because at three years there is primary molars seven uh, permanent incisors and molars 11 and 13 uh, canines and premolars so this has to be applied on recently erupted tooth to utilize the 10 percentage post eruptive mineralization so the advantages of neutral sodium fluoride is that it is a basically stable product and we can uh, store it in a plastic container uh, taste is well accepted by uh, the patients and it is uh, non-irritating to gingiva it does not cause uh, tooth discoloration but the main problem is 
it has to be repeated at four intervals of one week gap that is the most uh, uh, commonly uh, commonly reported disadvantage of this neutral sodium fluoride because it is not applied uh, annually or semi-annually it is applied at weak intervals and that has to be at four times and there should be application at different age groups that is 3 7 11 and 13 if it is applied uh, for the same person it has to be done 16 times so each year four times at one week interval so the second product is stannous fluoride so it's most commonly used at eight percentage okay so the two percentage sodium fluoride or it is known as neutral sodium fluoride second one is stannous fluoride eight percentage so this is prepared by 0.8 grams is dissolved in 10 ml of distilled water in a plastic container and it has to be prepared freshly and there is no stability if you are using it for a patient you have to prepare it at the moment and use it you cannot prepare and keep it for the next patient so it is like 0.8 grams in 10 ml of water whereas sodium fluoride was uh, like 20 grams in 1 liter of water 20 grams in 1 liter of water whereas stannous fluoride is 0.8 gram in 10 ml of water okay so technique is same you have to keep it for four minutes you have to dry the tooth keep cotton rolls isolate it properly then apply it for four minutes so it reaches its maximum concentration and uh, you can repeat the application at every six months not like one week interval for four times like we seen in sodium fluoride it has to be applied uh, for twice that is six months interval for the one patient there is no age uh, category what we have seen in sodium fluoride so the four minute uh, theory i have told you because the amount of fluoride reaches on the top of the uh, surface by four minutes so even if you apply for eight minutes there is no point maximum concentration is achieved within four minutes so four minutes is the ideal time so advantage is only two application is needed unlike uh, four applications and the base when the disadvantages are it is not stable you have to freshly prepare for each patient and it is quite astringent and its taste is little odd and application is unpleasant so there is a uh, reports of tissue irritation and pigmentation of teeth so none of these are available uh, these are present in sodium fluoride so this is not stable and pleasant tissue irritation and gives pigmentation so advantages advantages are just like we have only one or two appointments in a year so the last one is apf or acidulated phosphate uh, fluoride so it is prepared by 20 grams of sodium fluoride in 1 liter of phosphoric acid that is 0.1 molar 20 grams in 1 liter of 0.1 molar phosphoric acid then add 50 percentage of hydrofluoric acid then adjust the pH at 3 and fluoride concentration at 1.23 this is known as Brutefeld solution this is known as Muller's solution okay this is Muller's technique the first one was Knudsen's technique Stannous fluoride is Muller's technique and the last one is root ball solution. So this is prepared by 20 grams in 1 liter 0.1 molar phosphoric acid. Then 50% hydrofluoric acid is added pH 3 concentration 1.23. Same method apply samely just like a stannous fluoride twice in a year uh, and keep it for 4 minutes commonly used in gels so gel uh, applied by tray method 
sodium fluoride and stannous fluoride applied by paint on technique just like painting this is applied in gels that is dry technique so four minute uh, period is also same here and the tray uh, we apply the material into tray and keep it uh, using a saliva ejector to control the uh, water contamination so this is tray technique we fill it uh, one fourth of the tray uh, height wise then we apply it like this maxilla and mandible we keep it for four minutes so advantages is just like sanus fluoride two application in here and gel preparation <laughs> sorry gel preparation uh, is not like uh, flu that sodium fluoride and stannous fluoride where tray technique is being used and the cost of application is reduced disadvantages is uh, practical difficulties are there and it is very acidic because of pH 3 and it cannot be stored in glass so just compare this, this percentage was 2 percentage 8 percentage and 1.23 percentage of fluoride ppm is 9000 almost 20000 and here it is 12300 ph in sodium fluoride it was neutral here it was uh, 2.4 to 2.8 almost acidic and it is also acidic and sodium fluoride total 16 application 4 at 1 week interval at 3 7 11 and 13 in years that is Four years each year for application total 16 application this is biannually this is also biannually sanus fluoride has a lot of uh, disadvantages to pigmentation gingival irritation uh, freshly uh, need to be prepared very freshly like that and most of the teeth uh, most of the products uh, gives a 30 percent age reduction so the remaining products are dentifices mouth rinse and gels dentifices commonly uh, we apply uh, uh the most uh, most of the toothpaste has fluoride and um, all uh, we can uh, give it uh, for children under six years of age it can be rinsed uh, it will uh, give caries protection then uh, methods is nothing but uh, 5 ml uh, should be rinsed uh, before bed and switch uh, between teeth uh, for a 60 seconds okay so that's all about uh, topical fluorides so the most important things are this one sodium fluoride stannous fluoride and APF so stannous fluoride has most disadvantages and we need to remember this table percentage ppm and pH frequency of application Okay, I'll come up with a new topic that is uh, prevention of dental caries by fluoride in my next session. Uh, in topical fluorides video, I missed out few things. Uh, having mentioned about the mechanism of action of uh, topical fluorides, that is uh, three techniques: sodium fluoride, stannous fluoride, and uh, APF. So in today's video, so I'll be explaining about the chemical reaction, the mechanism of these three techniques. So in Nutsen's technique, we know that we apply neutral 2% sodium fluoride and we apply it for uh, 4 minutes and it is, uh, there is a 4 applications and 1 week interval that is on 2nd, 3rd and 4th application will be at 1 week interval and it will be applied on age 3, 7, 11 and 13. So there will be a total of 16 applications. So let's see what is the mechanism of action. So how this topical fluoride of sodium fluoride helping the tooth to fight against dental caries. In systemic fluoride we have seen the fluoride goes into the enamel and it replaces the hydroxyl ion and it creates a fluoro hydroxyapatite or fluoroapatite crystals which is very stronger than the normal hydroxyapatite so let's see what is happening in uh, sodium fluoride mechanism or Nutsen's technique 
so when we apply sodium fluoride what happens is this sodium fluoride it reacts with hydroxy apatite crystal and to form calcium fluoride this is a byproduct which forms calcium fluoride so it start getting formed the calcium fluoride is getting formed on the surface and a thick layer is formed at the end of four minutes so what happens after that this thick layer calcium fluoride interferes with further diffusion of fluoride so once this thick layer is formed we apply sodium fluoride again and again there is no point because this thick layer interferes with further diffusion so there is no point applying sodium fluoride after four minutes so that is why most of the topical fluorides are applying at a period of four minutes so this particular process is known as chalking of effect this is very important it is uh, seen in sodium fluoride once the calcium fluoride is formed after the application for a four minutes period it further prevents the diffusion of fluoride so it blocks further entry of fluoride ions and it is known as chalking off effect so this sudden stop of entry of fluoride is termed as chalking off so this calcium fluoride act as a reservoir so this calcium fluoride will be there on the surface and it slowly releases the fluoride okay so it is not the sodium fluoride it releases the fluoride for the prevention of dental caries it is actually the calcium fluoride releases the fluoride so we might think that it is sodium fluoride is releasing fluoride but no it is the calcium fluoride so calcium fluoride reacts with hydroxy apatite then there will be fluoride uh, high fluoridated hydroxy apatite which increases the concentration of fluoride on enamel surface and prevent caries so from calcium fluoride the actual fluoride is releasing out okay not from the sodium fluoride so that is the chemical reaction happening with the first topical fluoride method that is Knudsen's technique. So all these techniques we have covered in detail in that video. So in this video I will be explaining about the chemical reaction happening and especially this phenomenon known as choking off effect. Choking off means we are strangling someone and uh, forcing uh, or preventing his uh, breath. So that is chalking off so similar way we are strangling the further entry of fluoride because calcium fluoride uh, act as a barrier it interferes with the further diffusion of fluoride okay so let's see uh, the second product that is tannous fluoride so we apply in uh, almost very high ppm that is 20,000 or around 20,000 ppm so all this we have discussed already so i'll be explaining about the mechanism of action so when stannous fluoride is applied at a very low concentration what happens is there is tin hydroxy appetite formation okay so stannous is nothing but tin it's a chemical name for uh, tin sn so tin hydroxy appetite is formed which gets dissolved in oral tissues when we apply in low concentration so that is the scenario when we apply in low concentration but when we apply at very high concentration what happens is there is a formation of calcium trifluorostanate so this stannous fluoride reacts with the calcium of hydroxy appetite and forms calcium trifluorostanate at the same time there is another product which is known as tin trifluorophosphate so these two products will be formed once stannous fluoride applied at very high concentration okay low concentration there is uh, no much action only tin hydroxy appetite forms at high concentration these two products are formed calcium trifluorostanate and tin trifluorophosphate so this tin trifluorophosphate is responsible for making the tooth structure more stable so this is the product which actually act as a uh, barrier or prevents dental caries 
because this is a product which helps to, to become more stronger than the normal hydroxy apatite uh, and calcium fluoride is the end product so after this there will be end product that is calcium fluoride in both low and high high concentration which reacts with hydroxy apatite and a small fraction of fluorohydroxy apatite also gets formed so at the same time along with this there is a very small amount of fluorohydroxy apatite because at the end product calcium fluoride is there so it reacts with hydroxy apatite and fluorohydroxy apatite but very low amount in sodium fluoride mechanism calcium fluoride is the main product okay but whereas in muller's technique of stannous fluoride this tin trifluorophosphate is the main product there is a calcium trifluorosanate but this is the main product which helps the tooth to prevent caries or make it very hot so that is the second mechanism of stannous fluoride or molar solution so let's see what is acidulated phosphate fluoride or APF mechanism okay so here what happens is when APF is applied to teeth in the beginning time there is dehydration and shrinkage of hydroxy apatite crystals because we are applying it at very low pH so it is applied at 1.23 percentage and uh, 3 pH which is very highly acidic so it creates dehydration and shrinkage in hydroxy apatite crystals and after that an intermediate product known as DCPD is formed that is dicalcium phosphate dihydrate is formed so this forms in APF so always there, there is no need of confusion when we apply sodium fluoride calcium fluoride is formed when we apply stannous fluoride calcium trifluorostanate and tin trifluorophosphate is formed we apply APF DCPD is formed so the DCPD is very highly reactive and starts forming immediately after APF is applied. So fluoride penetrates into the crystals more deeply through the opening. So there was shrinkage and dehydration. So this fluoride can easily penetrate to the deep form, deeper uh, parts of enamel and forms fluoroapatite. So this DCPD is a crucial uh, product which forms when we apply APF. So this DCPD formed which will be later converted into fluoroapatite. Okay, so uh, the compounds which are uh, very vital in APF is DCPD, stannous fluoride which is uh, trifluorophosphate and in sodium fluoride technique it was calcium fluoride and talking of effect seen in sodium fluoride. So these are the three uh, techniques which uh, we use to apply topical fluorides and the mechanism and its chemical reactions so that's all about the mechanism of action which is uh, associated with um, topical fluorides so after that we have seen all this uh, the comparison which we have discussed already the pH percentage and all other things and fluorides so I'll come up with a new video so it, it was just a, a extension of our topical fluoride video uh, just to uh, give you a brief idea about the chemical reaction which is happening with the topical fluoride application thank you continuation of fluoride topics so today we have a very small topic that is prevention of dental caries by fluoride so we have learned uh, various uh, fluoride mechanisms like systemic fluorides, topical fluorides and its uh, gross mechanisms like systemic goes to the blood circulation, it enters to the mineralization stage and uh, replaces hydroxyl ion and making it fluoroapatite crystals. Uh, whereas in topical Fluorides, the mechanism is different because it uses the post eruptive mineralization where this fluoride forms calcium fluoride by combining with the calcium of 
enamel and this fluoride will be available for further remineralization so the mechanism is different where the systemic utilizes the pre-reptive mineralization stage which is the majority that is 90 percentage of total mineralization and it has to be done before six or seven years because most of the teeth get mineralized before seven years and post-reptive mineralization will be utilized in topical fluorides where the 10 percentage of the mineralization will be used but that is very critical because it is lifelong remineralization and demineralization will be happening in our tooth because our teeth uh, in oral cavity are subjected to various pH and various uh, changes in day to day life so basically what happens when a fluoride is incorporated into teeth we have learned already so in today's video I will be explaining few mechanisms whereby fluoride prevents dental caries <laughs> the first mechanism is fluoride increases the enamels resistance and acid solubility because it replaces hydroxyl ion in the enamel lattice because it is a hexagonal shape which has a central void where the hydroxyl ion is located since fluoride is very highly electronegative it replaces the hydroxyl ion both are negative ions so it replaces the hydroxyl ion and it fills the void which is present inside the enamel lattice and makes it very resistant to acid attack so that is why it becomes uh, resistant uh, when there is a acid challenge happens because it forms fluoroapatite we know enamel is a hydroxy apatite crystal so this hydroxy ions that is OH ions will be removed and it becomes fluoroapatite so this hydroxyl ion that is OH ions is less electronegative than this fluoride ion so this will be replaced and this fluoroapatite will crystals will be formed so that is why it is becoming very resistant uh, and it is making uh, acid less soluble whereas the second mechanism is remineralization potential of fluoride so if we add fluoride uh, in our drinking water or if we keep fluoride in our topical or toothpaste or any solution gels forms varnish what happens is fluoride will be present in the oral environment uh, maybe in the gingival crevicular fluid or saliva and it will be act as a reservoir to uh, replenish the lost uh, ions in the teeth so day to day we may lose uh, so much of ions because of our uh, acidic uh, food taking and or brushing or many factors we lose day by day some ions but if fluorides uh, is present in the saliva or GCF it can easily replenish the lost ions so remineralization will be favored and there will be a less caries chances so topical fluorides also it has the advantages of presence of fluoride ions in the GCF and saliva. So it gives fluoride ions whenever uh, there is a uh, loss of ions from the tooth surface. So it always protects the tooth by providing fluorides whenever there is demineralization. So remineralization potential is very important because every day it act as a reservoir inside saliva or GCF and fluoride also has antibacterial effect because it interferes with the bacterial cell growth because it has inhibitive effect on the enzymes which are essential for cell metabolism and growth that is streptococcus uh, bacterial <laughs> enzymes are destroyed or inhibited by this fluoride and it reduces surface energy of tooth and it can strip off bacteria from hydroxy appetite because fluoride can bind more effectively to positively charged areas on the appetite crystals than the bacteria so obviously fluoride is beneficial so if it uh, attaches on the tooth surface and the bacteria has no place to be attached there is no plaque formation and ultimately less caries so this is the antibacterial effects and the fourth point is increased rate of post-eruptive maturation so i told you already 
there are two phases of maturation of a particular tooth pre eruptive maturation that is happening before the tooth erupts into oral cavity and post eruptive maturation and post eruptive maturation is critical because it is a lifelong process every day we have ion loss from the tooth surface and at the same time the ions are coming back to the tooth so if the ion loss is becoming more compared to the uh, re the replenishment then there is chance of caries but the rate of post eruptive maturation is why it is important because this fluoride has a special capacity to remineralize the hypomineralized areas that is its biggest advantage so wherever the tooth is not properly mineralized that areas will be soon or fastly remineralized by the help of fluoride and the newly erupted teeth we know the newly erupted teeth are still uh, need to get mineralized by 10 percentage so these teeth can uh, attract fluoride very easily so we should apply fluoride always to the newly erupted teeth that's why fluorides are applied on to the newly erupted teeth in nuts and stuff we have seen it is applied on 3 7 11 13 so all the teeth are like per deciduous molars permanent molars and incisors canines premolars so soon the tooth erupts into the oral cavity we should apply fluoride because this fluoride will soon be uptake soon will be taken into the surface because these areas are hypomineralized it get mineralized only after three years or two to three years the complete mineralization happens the post mineralization happens by after two to three years and there will be a lifelong remineralization demineralization cycle so we have to use that potential once the tooth erupts into the oral cavity we should apply fluoride that is why we are applying topical fluorides into the recently erupted tooth and the last mechanism is modification in tooth morphology so it has seen that people who consumed fluoride water has changes in the diameter and cusp depth compared to the people who have not taken fluoride water so it reduces the occlusal uh, depth and occlusal cavity will be lesser and uh, lesser chances of caries because of this improved morphology of occlusal surface uh, can be attributed to the lesser amount of caries so the diameter and cusp depths are smaller the fluoride is present so this is a very small topic these mechanisms are the real reason why the fluoride prevents dental caries okay so these were the mechanism the first one was uh, it increases uh, enamel resistance to acid solubility there will be less acid soluble enamel then there will be remineralization there is antibacterial effect and increased rate of that is in hypomineralized area there is increased rate of post eruptive maturation and there will be modification in tooth morphology that's you i'll be explaining about various uh, defluoration techniques which are commonly used by the uh, indians that is uh, 15 out of uh, 30 states have affected with uh, fluorosis so the common practices which are seen in India is explained in this video so I have explained you uh, about um, fluoride as a double-edged sword in my uh, fluoride toxicity video uh, because once it is uh, going low it can uh, cause or it can attribute to formation of tendal caries and if it is going high it causes fluorosis so in 1984 uh, who guidelines suggested that there should be one ppm uh, for the optimal uh, fluoride or one ppm should be the optimal fluoride concentration so as to get the maximum benefit of it to prevent uh, prevent dental caries so if it, it is a, a warmer climate uh, the ph uh, the ppm can be low around 0 0.7 0 0.8 and if it is a cooler climate it can go up to 1.2 so the range varies between 0.7 to 1.2 because uh, it is affected with the uh, temperature so uh, we can uh, we have already learned uh, the modeling because in the history of fluorides we have seen the 
mortal enamel if it goes higher uh, the mottling and uh, discrete pitting will be seen so if it goes one two uh, three four five range it causes a severe uh, destruction of the tooth so uh, for your information the highest uh, naturally occurring fluoride is recorded in a lake in kenya and the lake is known as nakuru and it has 2800 milligram per liter that is 2800 ppm so we are talking about one two three ppm but uh, this lake has 2800 ppm this milligram per liter is ppm so india has uh, 15 out of 32 states that includes union territories uh, we don't have 32 states as such uh, it includes union territories so 15 of total this states and union territories are affected with fluorosis that is endemic fluorosis is present for a very longer period because uh, uh, groundwater has high amount of uh, fluoride content so in india we have uh, in usa we have seen uh, the community water fluoridations uh, were happened in many cities but in india there is no possibility of community water fluoridation because we are suffering from the excess of uh, excess amount of fluorine or the fluorosis so we are always thinking about defluoridation not the water fluoridation because we are at the other edge of the uh, fluorine because we are getting disadvantage out of fluorine so mainly the gujarat rajasthan andhra are uh, the 50 to 100 percentage of the district in these states are affected in kerala it is uh, alapi and palakkad were affected mostly but in these states have a severe uh, attack of this uh, fluorosis that is almost 50 to 100 percent districts are affected so let's come to the point that is defluoridation so what we are doing is we are removing fluoride from the drinking water that is the idea behind defluoridation so what we can do is either we can remove the fluoride from water or you can uh, go for an alternative source of uh, safe water uh, and bring water from a very distant sources so those are the uh, options we have but the most uh, convenient and most uh, feasible method is uh, defluoridation that is remove the fluoride from the water we have so we have few methods defluoridation and uh, by definition it is a downward adjustment of level of fluoride in drinking water to the optimal level so we have learned fluoridation is upward adjustment so we are increasing in community water fluoridation the upward adjustment of fluoride but whereas in defluoridation it is a downward adjustment of level of fluoride in drinking water to the optimal level that is 1 ppm so we have the common methods as adsorption uh, technique ion exchange technique precipitation technique and some techniques known as a reverse osmosis so adsorption is keeping some material in the water and the fluoride will be adsorbed to the surface an exchange is uh, re replacing the fluoride ions by cations and anions precipitation is just like our uh, water purification method we add uh, alum lime and bleaching powder and precipitate the fluoride by making it a flux okay so this precipitation method is the most common also known as an algonda technique which is almost same as uh, our water fluid uh, water uh, purification or uh, the process which we have seen in the water plant the uh, flocculation uh, sedimentation filtration uh, all those procedures are same in this precipitation technique so water purification is almost same so let's see one by one first one is adsorption technique it is nothing but adsorption of fluoride ions onto the surface of an active agent we put some active agent into the water and get the fluoride adsorbed not absorbed adsorbed on the surface so the material used are activated alumina activated carbon and bone char bone char is nothing but bones of uh, this uh, dead animals so it can uh, it has a property to adsorb uh, this fluoride 
okay so activated aluminium uh, alumina which is uh, launched by UNICEF in rural India because rural India is mostly affected with fluorosis so uh, alumina can be uh, inserted into the water and it adsorbs the fluoride but the most problem uh, faced with this alumina application is um, adsorption of fluoride only at specific pH range so we have to uh, check the pH range whether it is suitable for this alumina application or not and there is always a pre post uh, ph adjustment of water water should be at a, a proper uh, ph for this alumina activation or alumina application and there should be frequent activation of alumina is needed which makes the technique very expensive so once we use alumina it get replen it, it needs to be replenished the active ingredient will be lost after a period of time so it needs to be replenished or frequent activation is required so these are the disadvantage of alumina so bone char as uh, the same uh, process bone char we put into the water and it absorbs uh, fluoride but the problem is it depends upon the temperature and ph of the water uh, but it is uh, economic uh, bone chars are economic because uh, it is uh, maybe available not like uh, activated alumina but the main problems are it can harbor bacteria and it it is a unhygienic method and it is very technique sensitive and the biggest problem in indian scenario is the cultural and religious objections we take bones of the dead animals uh, it may cause problems uh, considering the cultural sentiments so the next uh, thing in uh, adsorption technique is brick pieces column so it is almost like activated alumina so it has a, a agent uh, a compound uh, uh, is the compound which is present in the brick column is aluminum oxide which uh, adsorbs uh, fluoride and also mud pots also can be used uh, to remove fluoride so water which is uh, kept in mud pots the mud pot uh, will receive or would adsorbs the fluoride and it is one of the common method which is used in the rural part because of its uh, economic point and it is commonly used commonly accepted in rural community because mud ports are easily available and it is cheap so there are some natural adsorption uh, adsorbents uh, like uh, drumstick uh, tree seeds of drumstick tree roots of vetiver grass and tamarind seeds uh, the MS Swaminathan uh, Research Foundation, that is MSSRF, had shown that this drumstick seeds to have a remarkable defloration efficiency, which is uh, higher than that of activated alumina. So, which is all natural adsorptions we have uh, drumstick seeds, uh, roots of vetiver grass, and tamarind seeds. So, these also can be used as an adsorbent. So, these were the adsorbing uh, techniques. So, we had seen uh, this natural adsorption, adsorbents and mud pot, brick pieces, uh, then the bone chars, activated alumina. So the next we have ion exchange method. So ion, ex ion exchanging method is using of synthetic chemicals, namely uh, anion and cation exchange. So the problem with this technique is it is very expensive and uneconomical in Indian scenario because uh, Indian scenario this fluorosis is mostly affected in the rural areas and they cannot afford uh, this type of equipments and this ion exchange techniques they're all um, convenient with the uh, adsorbing techniques till uh, the Nalgonda technique has come into uh, practice so one of the ion exchange technique the compound used is carbon it is a cation exchange resin so it can be used on sodium and hydrogen cycle so it exchanges the cation whereas the defluorone one and defluorone two are different one so defluorone one has it is a sulfonated sawdust which is mixed with two percentage alum solution the defluorone 2 was developed later to overcome the problem of defluorone 1. It is sulfonated coal using alumina solution.
Okay, first one was shortest, whereas the second one was coal. Both are sulfonated. Uh, so that was a very expensive method. Uh, this carbon, defluorone 1, defluorone 2, the ion exchange method. So the ion will be exchanged. Either the cation or anion. The ion of this fluoride compound or this fluoride will be. Because fluoride never stays as an ion. It always uh, exists as a compound. So the product we apply will replace the ion or it exchanges ion and reduces the fluoride availability or the presence in the drinking water. So make it to a uh, drinkable condition. So this is not uh, used because of its uh, expensive nature. And the most common method we use is a precipitation technique. So disadvantages of ion exchange and adsorption techniques we have seen because there need to be a necessary flow system and it is often difficult to arrange if there is no pipe to water supply if people are taking water from the wells or rivers or something like that uh, ponds or such uh, water supply uh, this is not possible the two methods which i explained already are not uh, run with this uh, well system there should be a uh, flow system that is it should go through the pipes and this equipment should be connected to the pipes and there should be a this is an active agent so there should be frequent activation of the agents there should be replenishment of these agents otherwise uh, the water won't be get the fluidation but the precipitation methods are based on the addition of chemicals uh, such as coagulants and precipitating the soluble fluoride as insoluble fluoroapatite. Okay, so it's just like what we have seen in water water uh, purification method. The big tank we add alum as a coagulant and it coagulate the impurities and the flocks are getting sedimented and it removed uh, from the bottom of this uh, chamber and then it goes to the filtration. It's uh, the same principle is being applied in Nalgonda technique. Uh, except uh, some extra agent uh, will be added here the Nalgonda technical fluidation is almost same as water purification and it was invented by NERI that is National Environmental Engineering Research Institute in Nagpur and it was uh, by Nalke uh, et al in 1974 it was a very economical and simple method so why this Nalgonda name came because Nalgonda is a district in uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, where they used this technique as uh, a indigenous method. Later this institute has taken up this method and commercialized and they started building uh, this plan for this rural people. But uh, Nalgonda is the area where this technique uh, was uh, in its primitive uh, fashion so they started it so the name was given uh, as Nalgonda technique Nalgonda is not in Nagpur it is in Andhra okay so what they're doing is they are adding sequence of sodium aluminate that is alum lime and bleaching powder to the fluoride water then do the flocculation sedimentation and filtration just like uh, our uh, water purification so in uh, co most commonly we add alum to the water purification plant or water purification the first step here we are adding lime and bleaching water uh, in a sequence so that is a difference in between this uh, water purification and nalgonda technique so it can be very useful for domestic and the community water supply so this is just a flow chart what we are doing is lime alum uh, and bleaching powder will be mixed to the first uh, point of entry and there will be a rapid mixing this is flocculation then there will be sedimentation the sediment will be removed from the bottom of the chamber and this goes to the uh, filtration so filtration slowly it get filtered and to goes to a clean water tank so the process is almost same as water purification only thing is it has a different reagent lime alum and bleaching water so mechanism is it commonly run for a 22 liters of water the first we do rapid mixing that is coagulant will be added to this water 
uh, then 30 to 60 seconds with a speed of 10 to 20 rpm the coagulant is rapidly mixed so it gets uniformly dispersed so it start getting micro flocks of fluoride because of this chemical coagulant then flocculation is the second stage where it is rpm is 2 to 4 in the beginning it was 10 to 20 now it is slowly run for 10 to 15 minutes the rapid mixing was 30 to 60 seconds the flocculation it is slowly uh, do the uh, rotation and it started um, forming the flocks because of this coagulant the fluoride compound will get become uh, will become flocks and it's starting sedimentation so due to this gravitational force this particles will be sedimented at the bottom and it will be removed okay as we have seen in the uh, diagram okay so we add here uh, we do the rapid mixing then for flocculation this is 10 to 20 rpm 2 to 4 rpm this is for maybe one minute this is for 10 to 15 minutes then this it goes to sedimentation this is a sedimentation tank here it will slowly or slowly uh, for 10 to um, 15 minutes and 2 to 4 rpm then uh, the sediment this flock flocks are removed from here because flocculation happened here and flocculation flocks are removed from here then it goes to the filtration and filtration and finally we get the clean water so filtration is same like uh, our uh, water purification plant so it get filtered uh, and we can uh, send it for the uh, domestic supply so maintenance is uh, very cheap it uh, is like 1.6 lakh for a 250 population and uh, only we need 50 stainless steel filters and it is uh, costing around uh, 35,000. So the main advantage it's is low cost of investment and low cost of maintenance. So the biggest uh, advantages are there, there is no need of regeneration of media which was seen in the adsorption techniques. No handling of caustic acids and alkalis. The chemicals are required are readily available and it can be used for domestic uses, economical, symbol, design, construction. We can use a uh, very large quantity of water which is very efficient removing fluoride from high levels and very little wastage of water and needs minimum mechanical and electrical equipments. There is no need of energy, only need muscle power. Semi-skilled workers also can be used. So the biggest disadvantage is if the total dissolved solid exceeds 1500 milligram per liter we need to do a prior desalination and hardness of water also matters if it is 200 to 600 it requires precipitation softening and if it is beyond 600 milligram per liter it needs becomes a cause for rejection or absorption of desalination. so uh, there will be a high amount of sludge compared to the other methods in algonda and there, sh there is a requirement of a large amount of alum so indications should be total dissolved solid should be less than 1500 milligram per liter total hardness should be 600 below 600 this should be below 1500 and raw water fluoride should be between 1.5 to 20 that is 1.5 to 20 ppm modifications are like uh, polyaluminum chloride is another compound polyaluminum hydroxy sulfate also can be used and the other methods are reverse osmosis electrolysis or electrodialysis are the physical methods that are tested for defluoration so this Methods are also can be used for a very small amount of water. So reverse osmosis is like uh, we use hydraulic pressure exerted on one side of a permeable membrane. We have seen it in uh, our uh, younger classes. What is osmosis? What is reverse osmosis? We keep a semi-permeable membrane and apply hydro hydraulic pressure, which forces the water across the membrane and leaving the salt behind so leaving the 
salt or fluoride behind and get the clean water on the other side. In electrodialysis, the membrane allows the ion to pass but not the water. Okay, so our idea is to remove the fluoride from this water. So we can use a reverse osmosis keeping semi permeable membrane or in electrodialysis the ions will be passed and the good water will be uh, left out and electrodialysis is also a uh, very expensive and uh, intensive procedures but uh, it is very rarely used all these reverse osmosis electrodialysis uh, techniques electrolysis also it is uh, process with uh, adsorption of fluoride with freshly prepared aluminum hydroxide which is generated by anodic dissolution of aluminum or its alloy in an electrochemical cell we have learned in chemistry what is anode what is cathode what is electrolysis so once uh, electricity passes this uh, ion moves to uh, anode and cathode so that procedure also can be used to uh, remove fluoride from water The uh, biggest advantage is it doesn't need any chemical and no need to pre and post treatment low volume of sludge but it is uh, uh, there is a requirement of electricity so that's all about uh, defluoration techniques because uh, like I said uh, 15 out of uh, total Indian states are affected with uh, fluorosis so we are into the action of defluoridation not water fluoridation because we are to remove the fluoride from the water to get people a palatable or potable drinking water so far we covered fluorides uh, history the systemic and topical fluorides fluorides and prevention of dental caries and of defluoridation techniques so let's see the details about fluoride toxicity Fluoride is known as doublet SWOT. So usually we know the SWOT we have seen in uh, pictures and the SWOTs used for the fighting. Hello everyone, welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more. Today we have a topic on fluorides that's fluoride toxicity so we have covered so far the history of fluorides systemic fluorides and the topical and the role of fluoride in prevention of dental caries and the various defluoridation techniques and the last one is fluoride toxicity so let's see the topic in detail so fluoride is known as double edged sword so usually SWOT will be having only one end which uh, we have seen the SWOTs in pictures one end it we have a handle and other end is serving its purpose so what if the SWOT has uh, double edge so it can injure with both the end, both the ends so that is uh, a double edge SWOT so fluoride is a double edge SWOT why because if the amount is too less and if the amount is too high it causes problem it should be at an optimal level just like a double edged sword it can injure a person with both the ends usually sword injures a person with only one end so similarly the fluorides if it is too low the patient or the people may get caries if it is too high it can cause fluorosis either dental or skeletal that's why it's known as double-edged sword because fluoride should be at optimal level for proper protection against dental caries that is 1 ppm or 1 parts per million if it is less than that the patient has a chance of getting dental caries that is a one disadvantage if it is too high it causes skeletal and dental fluorosis that is the second disadvantage so on either ends it has disadvantages so it should be at optimal level that is 1 ppm so the toxicity is broadly classified as acute acute and chronic so don't forget 
the double edged sword concept of fluoride when it is low and when it is high it causes problem okay so the acute and chronic as we all know acute is sudden chronic is the slow uh, slow action acute is very fast uh, just like a single ingestion of very large amount of fluoride so that becomes acute we know acute pain and chronic pain acute is sudden uh, pain and chronic is slow throbbing type pain so similarly the fluoride if we uh, consume very large amount in very short of period in a single shot it's known as acute and chronic very slow amounts over a longer period of time so let's see what is acute toxicity so acute toxicity as we mentioned a large amount ingestion in a very short period or a single shot so the speed and severity of response dependent on the amount of fluoride ingested and the weight and age of the individual so it depends the prognosis or the outcome of the patient depending on how much fluoride we have consumed and weight and age of the individual so most common adverse effect is nausea and the patient may have abdominal cramps vomiting diarrhea and salivation dehydration and thirst so after two to four hours fatality is possible if first aid is not administered so the golden hour is first two to four hours so we should do the treatment give him proper treatment or the emergency treatment at the first two to four hours so usually death happens if the treatment is not given by cardiac failure or respiratory uh, paralysis so that is acute toxicity the symptoms and the golden hour two to four hours so if the death is not happening after 24 hours then the prognosis will be good so we need to learn the two doses here one is certainly lethal dose also known as cld and safely tolerated dose that is std <laughs> so cld is 32 to 64 milligram per kilogram body weight and safely tolerable tolerated dose is 8 to 16 gram so that is almost one fourth of the cld so that is the easy way to study the cld and std cld is equal to four stds you can just see if multiply eight you get 32 with four 16 into four you get 64. so certain lethal doses is per kilogram body weight if you multiply with mm, 100 uh, you get 3 grams 3.2 to 6.4 grams kg so 100 kg body weight uh, needs a 3.2 to 6.4 grams because we are converting milligram to gram okay so it becomes 3.2 to 6.4 gram of 100 kg body weight person so if a person consumes 3.2 to 6.4 gram of fluoride it might leads to death of the person so on an average you can take 5 gram as your lethal dose so if you consume 5 grams of fluorides you might die so that is certain lethal dose and safely tolerated dose is one fourth of cld so we can say that if person has 100 kg safely tolerated dose of the body is 0 0.8 to 1.6 gram so this is milligram and i'm talking about gram because i'm talking about a person with body weight 100 kg for your easy comparison so we calculated 5 grams here and uh, we can say is one fourth the safely tolerated dose it will be around one one point two five gram can be tolerated by the body so that is cld and std 
okay so this will be if we calculate we get 5 grams and this will be around 1 1.25 gram up to 1.25 gram we can tolerate it we can tolerate body can tolerate that amount and if it goes four times and it becomes five grams around five grams patient uh, or the person might die so what we do if we face a situation of fluoride toxicity in uh, in our house uh, house or in a clinic or anywhere anywhere around us where a person consumes a large amount of fluoride uh, by mistake or uh, any suicide attempt what we are supposed to do so first try to uh, understand the difference that is we have three types of treatment that is if the uh, amount consumed is less than 5 milligram per body weight and 5 to 15 and more than 15 okay so it is uh, like if person has 100 kg weight okay so this is 0.5 gram it becomes 0.5 gram and this is 0.5 to 1.5 gram and this is more than 1.5 gram so we need to understand the amount consumed okay, this is just kilogram per body weight so i am uh, explaining uh, explaining about a person who is having 100 kg okay so you can uh, can calculate if the person has around 80 70 kg it will be somewhere here 0.4 grams or something like that so if it is very less just uh, 0.5 gram we need to give calcium because calcium binds to this fluoride fluoride is highly electronegative ion exists in highly electronegative state that is f minus so it will immediately react and bind to the calcium okay so calcium fluoride will be formed because uh, it's very difficult fluoride to stay as an ion so it always exists as compound so if we give calcium this fluoride will uh, join with calcium and becomes calcium fluoride so it relieves GI symptoms and there is no need for induced vomiting if the person is consuming around 0.5 gram less than 5 milligram per body weight so what if the consumption is between 5 milligram to 15 milligram per body weight or 0.5 to 1.5 gram okay all calculation I am uh, referring with a person of 100 kg so what we have to do is we have to induce vomiting using any emetic and we have to give the same oral calcium just like milk 5% calcium gluconide or calcium lactate solution and we should uh, rush him to the hospital for observing for few hours so vomiting oral calcium and taking him to hospital will be the treatment scenario if it is a moderate amount that is 0.5 to 1.5 gram so what if it is very high dose like 1.5 gram so we know lethal dose is 5 gram so we have to take him to the hospital very immediately and induce vomiting and we should monitor the cardiac and we should keep iv not orally iv calcium gluconate because that absorption uh, absorption should be very fast and supportive measures and sometimes uh, diuretics also we should keep so if we don't know the amount consumed it's better to take him to hospital and uh, can assess the symptoms uh, if patient is very uh, okay if person seems to be okay can assume that the amount consumed is uh, mild or moderate person uh, is not properly oriented and person has uh, this uh, vomiting tendency and dizziness so all those symptoms you can rush him to hospital so these are the various protocols for emergency treatment of fluoride exposure so next is the chronic fluoride toxicity 
practice uh, commonly uh, there are two types that is one, one is dental and skeletal fluorosis so chronic we know it is a chronic consumption over a very longer period of time not immediate consumption and it doesn't need uh, immediate treatment because it happens over a very longer period so dental process we know the tooth optimal amount of uh, fluoride in drinking water is 1 ppm if we are consuming water with more than 1 ppm for a very longer period especially during the tooth development that is the highlight point tooth development that is less than six years old because uh, the second molar will be finishing its mineralization around six years so if person consumes water with fluoride more than 1 ppm after six years there are very less chances of fluorosis because most of the teeth completes its mineralization cycle so if person consumes water more than 1 ppm during the mineralization cycle there are chances of dental fluorosis so most commonly the fluorosis appears as white flex and choky opaque areas on the enamel okay so most commonly it should be at uh, 1 ppm and if it is going higher and higher the, the appearance will be changed if it is 2 ppm or 3 ppm that is two or three times greater it will be white flex or choky opaque areas where if it is going high that is 4 to 5 ppm it become brown and pitted corroded appearance that is a severe form of fluorosis that is about dental fluorosis that is uh, in range uh, 1 to 5 ppm we can say if it is going very high more than uh, 6 7 8 ppm our bones also will be affected usually uh, all mineralized structure will be affected but mostly uh, it is visible on the teeth if it is a very milder or the up to 3 to 4 ppm the skeletal structures also will be affected but we cannot uh, make it very obvious because it is bones we can't see the bones so the only uh, calcified tissue uh, we can see is our teeth so it is very visible on the teeth so the uh, visible changes that what we can see in our bones is the uh, uh, crippling stage it is very uh, a very bad situation because the bones will be crippled and its shape will be changed so that is the only state where we can see the bone uh, or skeletal fluorosis not like dental fluorosis so it happens only when the fluoride amount is more than 8 ppm so symptoms will be severe pain in the back, bones, joints, hips and stiffness and there will be a special syndrome known as knock knee syndrome because usually we can bend our legs and hands only in one side backward but we can do outward bending of legs and hands that is knock knee syndrome it is very advanced stage of skeletal force so that's all about uh, dental fluorosis and skeletal fluorosis which is seen in chronic fluoride toxicity and acute fluoride toxicity it requires treatment immunity treatment various stages i have mentioned and uh, chronic uh, toxicity so fluoride is a double-edged sword if it is used at a proper optimal level that is around 1 ppm it gives proper and a good protection against dental caries so that's all about fluoride toxicity i'll come up with a new uh, topic in my next uh, video so thank you for watching so that's all about uh, fluoride toxicity so we have completed the fluoride topics so in my next session i'll uh, pick up a new topic Uh, that's all about uh, fluoride toxicity so we have completed the fluoride topics so uh, i'll come up with a new topic uh, in my next video thank you for watching